I, I had a wonderful experience there. I got to teach all kinds of stuff. I got to teach philosophy. I got to teach German. I got to teach uh, uh, woodworking, which was my primary responsible, mechanical drawing. I started a, a computer assisted design program with AutoCAD in 1985 when desktop computers were just coming out. And um, over the years, uh, I got a bit, I, I, I ended up getting frustrated because we were so cramped for space in the wood shop. Now, two years before I retired, they decided to build a whole new facility for the arts, uh, uh, as luck would have it. But I got the design part of it, but, uh, uh, you know, then never got to work in it very much. Uh, I got frustrated in about two, about the year 2000 because we were so cramped with shop space and we were building furniture, we were doing shakers furniture and we were building the Windsor chairs from scratch and we didn't have enough space to assemble the damn stuff. Uh, so I finally went out on a limb. I went back to, I went back to the administration said, I want to buy some lathes. And I bought six little jet mini lathes that had just come out. I think at the time around then, um, set them up in the shop, uh, and started teaching myself to, to turn. Uh, I had I had four classes scheduled about two months after I bought the lathes and uh, needed to get up to speed. So I guess Richard Richard Raffin's books kind of bailed my ass out real quickly. Uh, and then it was a year of just staying ahead of kids uh, by about a week, usually uh, working on the lathe. Um, it was probably the best thing I did in terms of uh, you know, the manual arts there, uh, as far as that teaching went. Um, cause what I found was instead of taking a year, you know, to build a Windsor chair, which is what it took us, you know, at 40 minutes of class, uh, uh, we were able to get down to business real quickly. Uh, I was able to start having conversation with conversations with boys about aesthetics, which, I never really had the opportunity to do when we were making furniture because you'd always work according to a plan. And, and this kind of opened the door to have an aesthetic conversation so that after about two or three weeks, I could look over their shoulder and say, you know, that looks really nice. That form is really nice, but, but it's a little bit fat right here. And they'd know what you were talking about. And it just, it changed the whole nature of it. So that we started actually, we started actually doing, making artwork, I think, pieces of art uh, instead of furniture. And that changed the whole nature of the thing. Um, um, so as the work progressed over the next 15 years, I retired about four years ago. Uh, I kind of more and more viewed the lathe as a tool for creating a canvas made of wood uh, that, that would then serve as a base for em further embellishment or further work. Uh, uh, so I guess my goal in kind of demonstrating this little candle holder project here uh, is not really to give a cookbook uh, for doing this particular piece, because I really don't do multiple pieces. I usually do one of a kind things. This is the second one I've made of this. Uh, uh, but, but the goal, I think, is to suggest that every piece of wood that you throw on the lathe doesn't have to be completely subjugated by the lathe. Uh, uh, I guess, in other words, uh, I think a lot of pieces of wood that you find are better left in their natural, beautiful state and simply embellished slightly with the help of the lathe and other tools. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's where my work is really kind of headed over the last 10 years, I think. Uh, uh, this little project that I'm gonna show is, is based on that premise, really. Uh, uh, it, it starts with a piece of cherry burl that I acquired uh, that had a great big, you'll see it has a great big chunk of bark in it. And it just sat for who knows how long staring at it because I, I really didn't know what to do with it. And then one day I picked it up and said, I don't need to turn this thing. I can turn part of it and leave that nice cherry stuff in there and some of the burl wood in it and, and uh, turn it into something completely different uh, than a, a typical uh, uh, turned bowl or lathe or whatever, okay? Um, so I think maybe if Joe, we could, uh, we could try to get this thing fired up here, see if it works, okay? So what, what I'm going to do is uh, um, I'll go through some slides that are part of the video. This is all a video that I edited. Bear with me. Uh, uh, I haven't edited a video since about five years ago before I retired. So this was 
I had to refresh some brain cells here to get the software working for me again. Um, and I'll just narrate this thing. And I, I, it's broken up into about 30 minute, about four 30 minute chunks. And uh, I'll, stop, I'll stop whenever necessary to take some questions. Okay, let me start playing here. This is the piece that we're gonna do, okay? It's a candle holder and the chunk in the middle, the, the chunk in the middle is the chunk I started with, okay? That, that's the burl with all the big bark occlusion in it. Uh, actually, it's the exterior of the, 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 uh, the burl. Uh, let's go on here. I'm gonna pause once in a while. I, I, put, this, I put this little card, it's one of my favorite cartoons about woodworking. And I, I think the significance it has for me is that it follows that premise that I was talking about that I, you know, that I used with, with kids. Uh, uh, I think there's a certain point where you, you just have to learn the skill, okay? You got to learn to be familiar with the tools that I was really adamant when I was teaching turning that um, nobody used a scraper until they knew how to use a gouge, okay? So we spent a lot of time at the beginning learning how to use the gouge to make pull cuts, push cuts, whatever, okay? And... Uh, only then did we start using a scraper, and uh, um, and I was adamant about sticking to classic forms, okay? Because boys tend to have a, a tendency to get on the lay, and the first thing they're going to do is make a lot of corners and sharp edges, and and a lot of shit that just looks terrible and that could hurt you if you if you if it fell on you. Uh, so I, I was adamant about you know, not doing that and just following classic forms. So I had a chart on the wall from Richard Graffin's book on, on uh, a bowl design that showed all the classic forms and we stuck with those. And then once we got past that, you know, then it was open season, I think. And uh, so I guess the cartoon says to me, you know, Picasso, Picasso didn't just throw buckets of paint at the wall. He was a very skilled craftsman, learned the art of painting and knew it backwards and forwards. And, but at a certain point, you know, he said, screw that, I've got the skill. And he went out and did other things with it. So I guess the message would be, you know, don't listen to the guy standing over Picasso's shoulders once you learn the basic skills and, and master them, uh, go beyond that. So let's, let's go on here. Uh, I, uh, if this doesn't make any sense, I, here's, I, I put together a couple of little slides that I, I think explain what I'm trying to say here. Uh, well, let's go through these. I went through my website and kind of look for things. Okay. I mean, here's an example. Here, here's a, a kind of a classic shaped bowl, or I guess you could call it, it became an urn because it now has a lid. Okay. And on the right, there's a completely kind of off the wall thing. This, this could have been thrown in the firewood pile, okay? And I looked at it and looked at it for a while and said, God, there's all, all these interesting things that are kind of inherent to this crappy piece of wood, okay? That are, that are really beautiful in their own right. They, they just need a little help. So that, that's where that went. So that, that's, the, that's the, you know, the left side is the, you know, the guy standing here over, over Picasso's shoulder saying, no, 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 on the right side is screw that, okay? Uh, here's, let's see, here's, here's another one, okay? Here's a, a kind of a classic uh, shape for a vase. It's a northern white cedar thing. And here's a piece on the right that was made out of scraps from a guitar maker, mahogany scraps from a guitar maker, uh, quarter inch things. And the only thing on it that's turned on the lathe is the little spout, okay? Uh, but I guess I found, especially with working with boys, that the more you kind of get out of this mindset that everything that you throw on there has to be turned, okay? The more it kind of frees you up to use the lathe to do a lot of other different things. Uh, let's see here. Next one. Here's another example of that. Left piece is a very traditional, you know, classic form. And the right piece has one piece that's made on the lathe. And yet I think it's inspired, I think it's inspired by the lathe, at least in my mind, okay? This was a chunk of firewood that was going to be, get burned up in my fireplace and started looking at it and it still has the chainsaw cuts in it and just with some embellishment, uh, it actually got into three juried shows and then, and then sold for about 600 bucks. So let's see, anything else here? Another one, uh, here's kind of a classic urn. 
okay, on the left. And on the right, here's a piece of uh, Australian river gum that uh, I didn't change anything except embellished it a little bit. It's, it was a block of wood that came like this to me and I just loved looking at it. And that's the way it stayed with some embellishment. And again, the only part that's turned on the lathe is the lid. And I think one more here, here's kind of a traditional cylinder that's turned on the lathe. Uh, these are candle holders. And then here's a piece I'm working on right now. It's a piece of juniper uh, that I've been having sitting around wondering what to do with it and finally decided I don't need to turn the whole thing. I'll just turn the inside and leave the outside as is. And it's now, it's got a, a aluminum cup in it that can hold uh, cut flowers if you want to. And then it's got a votive candle thing that was set right on top of that as an inset. Uh, let's go on here. Okay, here, I think this is the final one. These are burls that, you know, I could have destroyed them by putting them on the lathe and turning them. And instead I just left them the way they are, did some finishing on them and, and then turned the, uh, uh, the areas on the top and bottom uh, to turn them into lamps, okay? One of my favorite things to make anymore is lamps. Uh, here's some pieces, here's a traditional kind of an urn shape that's a, a, a kind of a weed pot. And the thing to the right here is uh, an Australian burrow. Again, the only thing that's turned on it, but it's all inspired by the lathe, uh, by, by vessels coming off the lathe. Uh, the only thing turned on it is the little piece of ebony spout up on top. And then the piece on the right is a piece of sassafras that had that kind of orangutan orange bark on it that I finally peeled off and it exposed that beautiful surface on it. And um, Nothing on it is turned, and yet I think if I hadn't done lathe work, uh, I wouldn't have made something like this. I, so again, I think it's inspired by the lathe. Let's see here. And here's the piece we're going to do in this demo. And again, it's it's this chunk of cherry burl with all of this bark, this thick bark in it. Uh, we're going to make that first. Uh, it's, it's turned and then beaded with a, with a D-way beading tool, although you could use just about anything like a, a, a gouge or a skew chisel or whatever to turn the beads. Uh, we make this little bowl here to accept the, the, um, the, the boat of candle holders and then a, a pedestal for it. Uh, and here, here's, a, here's a kind of a sequence of things so that you can see what's going to happen. Uh, the inside of the cup here has has two recesses. One, can you see my mouse here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. Anybody still out there? Yep, you we're did. here. You okay. <laughs> if, if, somebody tell me if this sucks, and I'll just get off. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing good. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, when I when I was in college in Germany for a couple of years, the tradition there used to be to uh, I don't know if it still is, when a professor would walk into a, a, a room to lecture, everybody would tap on their desk with their, with their knuckles out of respect for the professor. But the, the other side of that coin was, if, they didn't like, if you didn't like what was going on in the lecture, people would start shuffling their feet. <laughs> so, uh, so if you don't like what's going on, shuffle your feet, because I won't hear it anyhow. Um, uh, the, there's a recess for a bigger votive candle holder, and then there's a recess that's about, you know, not quite a quarter inch deeper than that to hold the smaller one. So it'll, it'll serve both purposes. And I think what you're going to see is when you do, when I do this textured burning, which I've really grown fond of, I, 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 I hate to think that on my deathbed, I'm going to think about all the time I spent burning millions of little Pock marks like this with the wood burner, but um, we'll see. Uh, um, you're you're going to see that it looks really scrappy when you 
burn this stuff in, but when you start finishing it off, it just comes up with these beautiful lines. And the key to it is scoring these lines here with the wood burner to create borders. Okay, let's go on here. So there's one, two, three, four basic parts for it. Uh, that, that cup is held in place with a brass with a brass rod that I have plenty of. There's still from my mother, their old brass curtain rods that I, you know, they were gonna throw out and, and uh, I saved them and I use them all the time now. So those are the two size votive candle holders that you can put in it. And there's basically the parts, okay? Um, here is a, this is a, actually this is the first iteration of this I did um, where I had another piece of cherry barrel that was very similar. And, uh, you know, finally turned it into that. Um, and you can, the, the, I, I put this on here because you can see the difference. The one that we're doing here is made with the D-Way. I think it's the 3 8 inch uh, beading tool, the D-Way tool cells, uh, which is a very nice tool. But this one was done before I had that. And this was just done with a skew chisel, okay? So you can see it's a rougher texture of beads, okay? And they're more irregular. I'm not sure which I, I like best. I think I like this one more actually. Okay, there's another example of that, of the difference. But they're very similar pieces. Okay, here are some pieces that are, they're all uh, turned off center. Okay, so they all use kind of the base, the same method that we're gonna do here, okay? Uh, these pieces, you know, uh, I haven't made any of those for a while, but they, they were very popular. And they were done with the skew chisel too, skew chisel and, and, and gouge uh, to, to do those beads. Um, and these were done with the center. Well, let me go to the next show thing because you'll see, I think it a little, did a little drawing here to show how they're centered. Here's the way they're centered. So that piece on the bottom here um, <coughs> has its center right here. So that's where the center of the face plate went. And then that create that leaves these two adjacent sides intact, okay. And then the, this this gets turned off as beads, okay. And um, if you taper the piece down, unlike this one, if this gets tapered down, it creates this kind of nice shape, these elliptical shapes, these irregular elliptical shapes uh, on the two adjacent sides, and. Um, uh, it, it kind of is a nice display for things like ant holes and stuff. And then the closer the center is to the center of the, the, the center of balance of the piece, um, uh, the more you're able to make like a spout that can then get drilled out with a Forstner bit. Okay. Uh, that's not going to be the case with the case with the piece we're doing here. Okay. Because I had to move the center way in towards the corner. Okay. Seeing the, okay. Here's, Here's just a glimpse of where I work. This is my shop. I'm pretty cramped, okay? Uh, I work on an old uh, DVR, a Nova DVR lathe, which I just upgraded with a new computer board. Uh, uh, I kind of like the machine because it doesn't have any belts and uh, it has some programming that you can throw into, the, into it that'll, that'll shut it off if it vibrates too much or whatever, if you're doing some crazy things which you'll see in a couple of spots here as we go along. Okay, you can see how cramped this is. This is the cleanest it's ever been, I think. There's, there's, there's all the shit on the wall <laughs> that I have to go through yet. I keep telling my wife that the, half the garage is full of wood that have accumulated and it's a race with death now. And I think death is gonna end, end up winning. Don't be so optimistic. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think it's, it's, a, more it's a pretty cluttered space. Okay, turning tools for this thing. Um, you know, these are some of the tools I use here. You know, I think I think the thing I use most in here is this little parting tool, little quarter inch wide parting tool. Uh, 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 Mike uh, Mike Nahal showed you some of the stuff on the hollow turning. Uh, he uses the Kelton. You, uh, Mike, I think you use the Kelton uh, hollowing tools that are just bars of steel, really, and like those. And I, I've always liked them too. I've got them in all different sizes, and I use them all the time. Um, um, what else here? Here's the here's the D-way 
This is the D-Way um, uh, beading tool, which comes in a bunch of different sizes. Uh, I like these Hutter tools uh, to do certain things. And I've kind of grown fond of this easy cut uh, tool with the carbide square tip. It, it, it's nice for hogging things out. And, uh, and just a great big uh, uh, negative rake scraper. Uh, that's about it. Actually, you, actually, if I if, if my life depended on it, I think I could do this whole project with this little parting tool and maybe a skewed chisel and a gouge. Okay, let's go on. Accessories. Here's the stuff I use most. Uh, uh, I like these little live centers. I th this was made by Wood River Tools. I don't think they have. I think it's out of production now. Um, uh, I use that a lot because it gives you a lot of flexibility with these different tips on it. I use this Nova uh, Live Center a lot because uh, I, I, I tend to use this cup a lot because it'll center things and balance things nicely. Uh, I The only sandpaper I use anymore are these rolls of, uh, they call them plumber's rolls uh, that are made by, that are, that are sold by online industrial supply. And if anybody wants references to these places. Uh, you know, I've got a list of these things I can send you with uh, references to where to get this stuff. Uh, they also sell these, these packs of sanding discs, which are the best I've really found anywhere. And they're really reasonable in price. Uh, a roll of this tape, this, uh, it's, it's plumber's tape, which is cloth back. So you can reuse it and reuse it and reuse it and just tear pieces off and not waste. Um, they sell for about 10 bucks a roll for a 50 yard roll. Uh, I like these these uh, Merca Abernet uh, discs. Uh, if you've ever if you've never used them, they're kind of like a mesh, and they they don't clog up. You just shake them, and they 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 get clean again. And uh, they're a little bit pricey, but um, and you can get them on Amazon. And then I found I, I've always had trouble with these sanding discs, and I finally found these on Amazon. You can get about five of these things in a pack for for fifteen bucks. And they're the best sanding discs I've ever found. The Velcro doesn't wear out. They just hold up like nothing. Um, okay. What else here? The burning and carving tools I'm gonna to use here. Uh, 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 these are all burning pens that I've accumulated. Uh, I really like these. They're made by a guy up in Minnesota that makes this burning unit here called an Optima 2 or no, this is the, the Optima one is his burning unit. This is the little micro grinder that has this hand piece uh, that I use a lot. These are all the burrs and stuff that it, it'll take. Uh, if you've never used one of these, they're fantastic. Okay, they, they, they put a Dremel tool to shame. Uh, uh, they, have, they have a, by default, they have a, a eighth inch collet, but you can size them down with these little collets to 330 seconds or 1 16th. And uh, they're very easy to pop in and out. And uh, uh, I use them a lot uh, with, uh, with dental burrs, with carbide dental burrs. Um, these little things are great too. There are these little, uh, there's these little uh, abrasive discs that are made by 3M. Uh, you can get them now by third parties on Amazon for like 15 bucks for a set of probably 200 of them, uh, including the, uh, the shanks. Let's see. And the, that's just another close up. Uh, okay, here's the procedure. First thing we're going to do is we're going to turn the base. Uh, then, part two, we're going to turn the bowl that attaches to the base. Uh, we'll make a pedestal for the base. And then, the last part is going to be texturing and burning and applying of finishes. And uh, after, after you make all the goddamn mess that I hate cleaning up whenever I turn, I think about my wife who's a fiber artist and spins and knits a lot and she's never got a mess to clean up. So I keep telling her I'm gonna, I'm gonna have her teach me how to knit one of these days and forget about turning. Okay, we're gonna first prepare the base with the place face plate. Okay, here's the chunk of wood. Okay, uh, I've marked some things on the bottom and I'll show you in a second here how, how it's marked up. Okay.
What I want to do is I want to be able to, I want to be able to keep this whole section in the middle, all the bark, okay, not touch that. Keep this flat spot here, keep the flat spot on this side, and then get rid of these two adjacent flat spots and bead them. So that's the, that's the curve that's going to be turned on the lathe. So you can see the center has to be pretty close to this bark here, which made this thing a little bit dodgy, okay? I'll show you in a second here with a graphic. Okay, so here's my center. And I just kind of did that by trial and error, holding a compass on here, and just to see where that center would actually generate an arc that would take those two adjacent flat sides down to a smooth curve and still preserve what's in here with this flat surface and this flat surface and the bark. Okay, so these two flats here would get round. Uh, these two flats will stay flat and the bark will stay where it is, okay? The problem you're gonna see with this is my face plate can only be mounted with two screws. So I wouldn't highly recommend this if you're kind of a beginner, okay? Because it two screws holding on here is a little bit dodgy, but, but it worked. Uh, if I had it to do again, I think I'd take a three quarter piece of plywood, screw it on with three screws where I could get a bite and then put the face plate onto the three quarter inch round plywood and it would be a whole lot more secure. But it worked. Let me go ahead a little bit here. So I'm just kind of checking to make sure that my, I don't encroach on the area that I want to save. Here's the face plate you can see. There's only room for two screws there. And actually I shouldn't say this in public, but one of them started coming loose as I was turning this thing. So I had to, I had to pull it apart. I'm not showing it. I had to pull it apart and put a splinter of maple, drive it into the hole so that I could get some bite with the screw threads again. And, and that held up pretty well. Okay, what I did here, what I did here is I, I, wanted, I want my tailstock to fit up against here to draw, to put pressure down the center line to keep it tight against that, that face plate since I've only got two screws in there. So I chiseled out, I just took a chisel and chiseled out a flat spot here in, in, in the bark and uh, for, the, for the, the point of the live center to touch down on and have a firm grip on. So that's what this is all about. Okay, I'm using that Nova Live Center with this with the sharp point on it, which keeps the keeps the whole thing out of the way a bit. Okay, and then I'm just showing these are the two areas that are going to be rounded and beaded. Okay, because those those flat areas are going to disappear since it's off center, and then these two flat spots are gonna remain, okay? And here's the place where my live center touches down. <clears throat> okay. Make sure we've got clearance. which I'm sure everybody's forgotten at some point. And then I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I'm not showing this because my video camera wasn't, it failed for a, a little section here, uh, but I just, I just used that Kelton hollowing tool, that straight hollowing tool to start hollowing this out a little bit. 
uh, into a, a bowl shape that's going to receive my my actual bowl. And here we go. I've already started rounding this thing, and I'm using that easy cut tool. I'm just using the corner of it as a lead edge just to start knocking this thing down round. And you can see it just keeps it keeps jamming on me. Okay, because uh, you keep hitting that that flat spot. Because half of this thing is air now. So it's just a little bit of a struggle to get started to get this thing round and smooth to keep it from jamming. Uh, one thing I like about the, the, these Nova lathes is that it has a vibration sensor on it. So it'll stop uh, if I start vibrating too much. And what RPM are you turning out there, Ronnie? Uh, I really don't know. I, I don't think it's more than three or 400. Uh, I mean, as, as I'm sure most of you know, as you get more experience with this, you, you do this more by feel and touch and sound than anything else, I think. And you can see this thing's bouncing around quite a bit. I had just moved my lathe. I've got, I've got four bags of 80 pound concrete you know, weighing it down, but it's not bolted to the floor. And I had moved it, but I hadn't wedged under it. So it had a little bit of play under it. So you can see it's kind of it's kind of shaking a bit because of the off center piece. So here it's starting to get round. I'm almost down to the point where where those two adjacent faces are are have disappeared into into roundness. And you can see it's not touching any of the pieces, the parts that I I want to keep as they are. And you can see it's getting it's getting smoother now. Keep getting little jams. So you have to you have to pretty much finesse this. Let me skip ahead because you don't need to be watching this. It's starting to cut pretty nicely now. You could do the same cut with a with a skew chisel or a, a gouge, whatever. I just kind of kind of grown to like this this square easy cut tool. I use a lot to hollow the insides of vases and things too, because you can you can sweep it right down the the inside uh, lining of a vase and get a nice straight cut. Okay, it's almost there now. So now I just took a little, I've got a little gouge and I'm just kind of starting to smooth that out. Probably my favorite gouge, it's a little, it's about a th quarter inch in diameter. It's an old Jerry Glazer gouge that aren't made anymore. And it's a fantastic tool. It's just got a fingernail grind on it and you can do just about anything with it. I, I use it on great big pieces too. So I'm just going across here. I'm just doing, I, I was doing a push cut, you know, rubbing the bevel and then a pull cut uh, just to smooth that surface out. There's a push cut. And then I just stopped. And I've never, I've, I've never done anything with this 4040 gouge thing. And then after Pete showed the whole thing, I ground one down and to 4040 and that's what this is. And I, I just I just threw this on here to show you could do this with just about anything. Uh, I'm just using a pull cut here and then I kind of go to a kind of a shear cut uh, just to smooth it out a little bit more. 
there's really, there was really no need to do this with two different tools. I just kind of threw them on here as an example. You could do it with separate ways. If you're a beginner, I, I still think the best thing to, to do is to just spend a lot of time practicing with the gouge and learning to do push cuts, bevel rubbing cuts, pull cuts, pivoting cuts, whatever. Anything you can do with it to the point where you're so comfortable with it that it's just automatic. You can go directly from a push cut, a bevel cut into a pull cut. Okay, now we're gonna turn the beads and I'm just using that D-Way tools, that special bead cutting tool, which is a very nice tool. It makes nice regular beads if you want that. And uh, it, it's very forgiving. And uh, I think some, somebody was showing that in a demo a couple, couple months ago. Um, and, and again, you have to rock it back and forth a little bit, side to side uh, to get the cut nicely. You can't just plow into it. You've got to finesse it too, but it's a very nice tool. And I'm just kind of going down the line here, and you know, you'll 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 take the you'll take that left hand point and put it in the last slot that was made by the right hand point, and you just kind of kind of leapfrog all the way down, uh, kind of do them roughly, and then I'm going to come back and clean them up, make them deeper. That they will leave a, you know, as you go along, as you get into them, they'll leave a flat spot up at the crest of the arc in here and then I just kind of tend to do all the beads first with that flat spot left in place and then come back and finish them all go a little bit deeper to to remove the flat spot so it's a clean arc on the bead and it's a little bit hard to see in the video here but I assume you're seeing a good ghost image there to be able to see those beads yeah there's a, there's enough of a ghost image to see it yeah exactly yeah I mean, as with anything like this, where there's, where there's a ghost image, you gotta be careful. And, and it, I think it's all about finesse and feel. So you can see it's bouncing quite a bit, but you know, if you keep, I, I keep my fist nice and firm against the, the tool rest and that balances it quite a bit. And, uh, and it, it, it's, it's pretty amazing, I think, that it makes as smooth a cut as it does, given all, given, given all the bouncing that it's doing and, and how, how crappy this piece of wood is. Let's move on a little bit here. Ronnie, it looks like sometimes you're turning in reverse I'm guessing that's just because the the. Yeah. I think that's the. I think that's an illusion. No, I'm not turning in reverse. Yeah, it's the it's the shutter speed on the camera that's. Yeah. Coming. And because yeah. it's turning so slow, it's it's those two are, um, kind of weird. I did have a I did have a place earlier on, and I don't know if anybody noticed it, where I was putting the faceplate on, and the faceplate was laying on the on the bed of the lathe. And there's a place where I had to reverse the video when I was editing because I forgot something, and uh, it's got that nice little magic thing that looks like telepathy, where the where the faceplate jumps off the bed of the lathe into my hand. No, I missed that. You missed it. <laughs> So it okay. looks like when you're using that beading tool, yeah, you said that you're moving side to side, but you you mean you're moving the handle? You're kind of sweeping uh, the handle. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sweeping the handle back and forth, maybe you know, maybe slightly ten to twenty degrees to either side, okay, of the perpendicular. Okay. Yeah, and I, that, he he recommends doing that, and it, you know, I, you can see why when you start using it. Because it, 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 otherwise it'll catch, okay? And you're just kind of opening up that, that cleavage in here, you know, at the bottom of the, the little valley and the cleavage, okay? You're just opening that up a little bit wider so that the tool doesn't get jammed in there. 
Gotcha. But I don't know if you can see right there, very slight movement side to side. That's all you need. See how, see how it's kind of pivoting back and forth? Might be five degrees off center. Yeah, yeah, I see that. You okay. see it? Yeah, so I'm just kind of moving side to side a little bit like that, okay? Yeah, if you never used one of these, they're, they're wonderful tools, really. Uh, very easy to sharpen. In order to sharpen them, you just you just throw it on. A, I use a Wolverine thing. I you know I used to do them by hand, and then I, you know when I had eight students, 30, 30 some students in a day in the wood shop doing this, I finally decided uh, nobody's going to sharpen their own tools because I'll spend days correcting the errors. So I just sharpened all the tools for fifteen years, and it's the only way I could do it. Is I just you know used a Wolverine thing and some. CBN wheels, and I was able to go through 40 or 50 tools, you know, in about an hour and a half like that. So I still do that. And the, this D-Way thing is very nice because you just throw it on the Wolverine thing. Or you don't even need a Wolverine thing. Uh, you can just have a kind of a tool rest and just throw it on there and just run it against the, run it against the, the wheel and you're sharp. You don't have to do anything else. So it's sharpened. The tool is actually sharpened on this surface opposite the flute. That's all you need to do. I better watch my time here. Where, where are we? Okay. I've got two hours of video, so. Okay, so now what are we doing here? Oh, I'm going to turn a. Uh, I want to drill a hole. I, I missed this part. I did this with that Kelton tool. I just hollowed this out a little bit. And, and I'm sorry I didn't show that because I missed the, my, my camera didn't pick it up. It went, went dead for that section. I couldn't go back. I'm just using this, uh, this easy cut detailer that has one tip broken off here, you can see. Uh, and it didn't work really well. I'm just trying to create a flat spot in here. A nice flat spot is a landing spot for my drill, my three eighth inch drill that I'm gonna drill a hole down into here with to accept this brass rod that's gonna hold the base to uh, um, uh, the little dish that's gonna hold the, the candle, okay? So I just wanted to clean that up in there just so that the drill doesn't bind when it starts in. And that, that's, that's all I'm doing there. So now I'm just gonna drill a hole into that, a three eighth inch hole. And you're going to see that I'm going to need to correct that afterwards on this piece because this bark is so thick. And now I just I got rid of that easy cut tool. And I went to my little my my little Sorby uh, parting tool, which which I think I use more than anything else to do all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm just using that to flatten that spot so that the drill has a nice start a nice start position without binding. <clears throat> and you're gonna find, you're gonna see that I'm gonna have to do something in here because the, the bark is not gonna hold that rod very well. So you'll see in a little bit, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a walnut plug that's an inch in diameter to go down into there and epoxy into there with a, with a three eighth inch hole in the walnut plug to hold the brass rod. And that one inch of diameter on the walnut plug is gonna actually bond to the solid part of the wood and kind of hold the bark on. And it, it turned out it worked really nicely. So here I'm just boring that hole the brass rod. You can see how kind of dodgy this whole affair is down here with the face plate. Okay, with only two screws in here. Especially now that there's no tailstock on here driving, you know, force right straight down the center to the face plate. So you gotta be real careful at this point with that without that that uh, life center on there. So I'm just cranking this down, cleaning out that hole. Let's move on a little bit. I, 
I turned the sound off on this because it just started, John, I found it just started drowning out my voice. There's the brass rod. And uh, I've got a whole pile of these uh, that my mother had with old curtain rods that would hang on the, hang on the bottoms of curtains. And they're quite oxidized, so they're nice because if I drill a three eighth inch hole and then, and then polish it off, polish the oxidation off a little bit, it fits nice and snug in there and I can glue it in. So now I'm just kind of, now I'm opening this up. I'm, I'm trying to create a flat spot in there. Uh, here, we're gonna do that here. What I wanna do is like I said, just that, that 3 8 inch hole here to, to hold the rod, the connecting rod uh, was pretty iffy because this bark really isn't very all that secure. I'm gonna glue this afterwards, you'll see with some super glue. But I decided to make this walnut plug to go in here because and then I'd get all this glue surface here with epoxy to the solid part of the wood that will actually then keep the, the bark from peeling off and it'll accept that 3 8 inch rod. Okay, so that's what this is all about. It was kind of a diversion that I didn't intend to take, but because the center was so far into the bark, there's the, there's the one inch walnut dowel. My hole, my three eighth inch hole is already drilled. And then I'm just kind of using that little parting tool to make that flat spot. Uh, I'm now making a one inch diameter flat spot down into that recess to accept a, four, a one inch um, Forstner bit. And I'm just making it nice and flat so that the Forstner bit will go down into that recess and also not bind when it goes in. So that it has a nice place to launch from, a nice flat spot to launch from. I really like this little parting tool. I use this for all kinds of stuff, you'll see. Okay, so I just keep sneaking up on this slowly because I, I want it to fit nice and snug. So, you know, it's taking about four or five times to actually sneak up on the right diameter. And I've almost got it there. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> And then I'm going to take. A, I've got that set. I'm going to I'm going to bore that out with a with a one inch Forstner tool. But first, I'm going to kind of clean up that that round socket, that recess that's going to accept my my cup or my little bowl that's going to hold the the votive candle in it. Okay, and I'm just using a a hunter tool here with that carbide bit on it, which works really nicely here because it's not very aggressive, especially since I've, I've only got this thing with two screws on the face plate and it's cutting that nicely. So I'm just trying to get that curve made uh, so that I can put my bowl in there eventually. And the, the hunter tool, I, if, you, if you've never used a hunter tool, they're, they're very nice because they've got a round shank. So you can set them at an angle, any angle that you feel cuts nicely to make a nice shear cut. Okay, you can see that's pitched at about 45 degrees or so. And it's making a nice clean cut on that surface without a whole lot of stress. You could do this with another tool too. You can do it with a gouge or whatever. I think I could probably do it with my little parting tool, I'm sure. Just kind of sweep a curve in there but I've got the hunter tool, so I might as well use it. I found over the years that I've got so goddamn many tools that I've accumulated, I end up using probably 5% of them. And, and half the time I'll work on a project where I've got a special tool that would do the job and I completely forget I have it. And then use something else. And then after I'm done, I look in a bin somewhere. I said, oh shit, I had this tool that could actually do this. So I think it's time to downsize. I'm just going nice and slowly here. 
I'm still not running any faster than probably 500 RPM. So that, that basically is gonna be the, the kind of the socket that accepts, okay, here's a little pause. Any, if there's any questions, any questions out there? Anybody still out there? Yeah, no, no questions. You're doing great. It's uh, you're answering everything as you go. Okay. Good, good job. Yeah, you no. kept 62 of 63 people. What's that? You kept 62 of 63 people. Holy shit. And nobody's shuffling their feet yet? <laughs> where do you get uh, your burrows? Where do I get the burrows? Any place I can. I, you know, I, uh, about two years ago, I made the mistake. We were on vacation. We were taking a trip down through uh, South, uh, North Carolina, and uh, I stopped at this guy, uh, Jim, I can't remember his last name, who imports Australian burls. Uh, he's down in the town of Chesapeake, and my wife said, why don't we stop there, take a look at his inventory? And we stopped there, and I ended up buying, I ended up dropping $2,500 on Australian burls. <laughs> about 30 of them. So I've got a lot of barrels. I, I, I've gone through about three quarters of them now and I've got some left, but any, you know, any place I can get them people, uh, I've got a lot of nice contacts at the school where I work because the uh, university school has a 200 acre campus and it's all old hardwood forest. So there's an unlimited supply of hardwood there. Um, uh, and I'll get a call once in a while say, Hey, there's a tree here that's got four burrows on it. It's got to come down. So I just accumulate them and uh, you know, some, if I find something really nice, I'll buy it or something. And, and then it sits on the shelf and I'm sure after I'm dead and gone, there'll be a lot of them left. <laughs> so I told my wife, if I, if I croak to call you guys and, and ask you if you want any of this stuff. Okay. I'm going to, any more questions? I just want to mention that um, your face plate is probably older than you. And um, if you get a modern one, they have more than four holes for for screws. You know, you yeah, can get know. six or eight. Yeah. You yeah. know, you know what that you know what that is, Mike. It's one of these. One, it's one. Uh, uh, when I was teaching, it's a face plate that has a hub with interchangeable plates on it. The, the plates actually screw into the hub. I don't know if you've seen these. And it was perfect for teaching because I could buy all the plates. I could have twenty plates and not have to have the whole hub. And they were just interchangeable. So that's what I'm using there. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, I should probably get rid of some of the turning tools and get some some modern face plates. Okay. <laughs> Under advisement. Now we're gonna turn the little ball thing that's gonna sit on top of this. Okay. Yeah. And we, we got we got bogged down in that burlesque conversation. And, yeah. and you're still talking about burls. It's still <laughs> okay. Now here I'm using one of those uh, one of those little gauges, you know, that you use for mostly for molding and stuff like that. I, Harbor Freight has them for about five bucks. <clears throat> and I just mounted the thing back up on the on the face. It's still on the face plate, and I just took this thing. I'm just trying to get the shape of that that curve, which I'm just going to be the basis for turning the little bowl that fits in here. And the bowl that fits in here is gonna, I, I'm gonna offset that by about a quarter of an inch so it hovers above that socket, okay? So there's no contact between them. So I'm just taking that, that kind of reading. If you're not using one of these, these are nice tools for things like this. Um, I should have marked the center here, but I'm kind of marking where the center hole is with my finger. And I'm just kind of pushing a couple of those those slatted things in just to mark where the center is. So I know exactly where the center of the piece is. <clears throat> you see that right here. That's where the center is. That's where my center hole goes down in there. So I've just marked this thing. Now I'm gonna take a piece of paper and I'm gonna transfer that onto the piece of paper and make a little template. So I'm just gonna hold this on here. Um, there's gonna be some zebra stripes that develop here once in a while. I'm sorry about those. I finally figured out what those are. Uh, I've got LED lamps above the lathe and they cause a flicker, I think on video at a certain frame rate and you start getting these damn stripes. And when I put the, uh, when I put the white paper in here, 
all of a sudden they start up because the, the white balance on the camera is getting screwed up. So here's my little profile. And then I'm gonna, okay. And then I'm gonna kind of freehand, I'm gonna uh, offset that by about a quarter of an inch, which is the amount that I want the little bowl to hover above the socket that it sits in. So here's my actual shape. And then I'm gonna take the pencil and I'm just gonna draw in about a quarter inch offset, quarter to three eighth inch offset. Okay, because that's going to be the shape of my bowl that I shape my bowl to so that the bowl actually sits about a quarter of an inch above the socket. And just kind of drawing that in. I made a mistake here. I went too high. I, I kind of forgot that uh, I forgot that uh, I don't need to go a quarter of an inch higher on the rim where it goes up over the edge of the socket. Uh, because of the geometry of it. So I had to correct that a little bit. Let's see here. I'm going to cut that out. So I cut this thing out, fold it over. There's that zebra striping from the, from the white balance. Second, I put that white card in there. It just goes haywire. Okay. There's my center axis, basically. So it's like a Rorschach, you know, ink thing. There's what I'm trying to fit to now, is that, that rounded socket here. Okay, and I'm gonna get ready, I'm gonna get the blank ready for the bowl. Now I skipped a little step here, and I'm gonna stop for a second here. Um, I'm starting here with a scrap piece of cherry that I had in my bin, okay, that already had kind of a, 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 a chuck spigot uh, in it, but it was big enough so that I could use this thing to make my little bowl, because it's going to be sized down quite a bit. So I just grabbed that out of the bin. So I'm not starting from scratch here, <clears throat> but I want to show you this, because this, this is the way I chuck things, and I've done them ever since I started teaching because I needed to find a quick way to make chuck holes where I was teaching boys and not run into the problem of, of designing the shape of the bowl so that it actually hit the chuck and then you're screwed at the end because you're, you're having a part right up against the, jaw, the, the chuck jaws. So what I kind of did, and I do this all the time, this is all I do when I make a chuck hole. I, 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 I almost never reverse chuck something to finish the bottom because it's already done this way when I finish, when I part the thing off. So here's what it is. Here's, here's the spigot, the dovetail for the jaws of the chuck, which is, is no deeper than the depth of the chuck, okay? So this distance here should be no deeper than the, the depth of the chuck here so that it, this part doesn't bottom out. And then here's a, here's a shoulder that I leave in here it's only about an eighth inch bigger in diameter than the, the, the bottom of the dovetail. So when I push the chuck in, that shoulder bottoms out on the surface of the, of the, the chuck jaws, okay? And then about an eighth of an inch in from that, I just use a parting tool and actually start the actual part where the thing's gonna be separated. And I found what that does for me is that the bigger I leave this space, if I've got enough material to do this, the bigger I leave this space, the more I have to work with in terms of designing the shape of the bowl, for instance, okay? So I could take this and actually shape my bowl, which we're gonna do with this piece, shape it down so that it actually curves down all the way to the, the, the place where it's gonna be parted and has a round bottom with no flat. If I wanted to put a little pedestal on it, I could still do that and still part it here, okay? And have my pedestal, and never have to do anything or reverse chuck it to clean that up because it's already been cleaned from the parting tool. And then usually I just decorate the bottom with a, with a little grinder, as you'll see, okay? So I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. It, uh, anybody have a question about that? You'll see how it fits on there. It's just no, a little bit of- a, That's a great idea. I do it with everything, with great big, huge pieces, with smaller pieces. Because I found when I was teaching boys, what would happen is that you miscalculate what you actually have to work with. 
And if I have that parting line already in there, that slot, I know that's the limit of where I have to deal with. So when I design my curve, I'm always targeting my curve at design actually to that point. So it builds in the boundary uh, that I have to work with, okay? If that makes any sense at all. Okay, let's go on. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna, since I pull this out of the bin, this is gonna get smaller and this is gonna get smaller too to fit a smaller chuck. So I'm gonna show you how I turn that down. And I, I really love this, uh, this Nova Live Center with that cup on it because I can mount the piece on a four, uh, you know, a, a four tooth spur uh, center and it'll, it'll balance it or make it nice and perpendicular because, the, because of the circumference of this thing. Uh, so I use this a lot to just quickly mount things with a, with a spur center. So I'm just gonna take this and <clears throat> again, I'm using my little parting tool and I'm just taking this down to make the spigot, okay? It's gonna have that kind of dovetail shape. And, there, and there's the shoulder that I'm leaving that's gonna, where the jaw, the chuck jaws are gonna bottom to. So I'm just, just turning that down into a spigot shape that's gonna fit my chuck. I'm giving it just a, light, a slight taper, you know, to turn it into a, kind of that dovetail shape that matches the jaws. And I kind of measured this ahead of time and, and, and I know that the, the diameter, the final diameter I'm looking for for the spigot is just a little bit bigger than this cup, okay? Which makes it nice and quick when I'm doing something quickly and I want, I want to make sure it fits into the jaws of the chuck. Okay, now I'm just taking down that shoulder. Okay, and you can see the space in here between the, the dovetail, the spigot, and the shoulder. It's only about an eighth of an inch, just enough to stop the jaws when you push the jaws onto the, the spigot. <clears throat> so now I'm just cleaning up space. Obviously, you have to have enough material on your piece that you can do this, but you only really waste you know, maybe a half an inch of material doing this. And then I'm just making a nice big area here. And then I'm gonna put the, the parting tool in here and part it somewhere in there so that I have that shoulder left. And like I said, the bigger the shoulder, the bigger that shoulder, the more room you have to do whatever the hell you want to in terms of the base of your piece. Because you all, you have all that material to work with and you know where the part, the final part is gonna be, which is gonna be right here. So I've got enough room here to actually make a completely round bottom bowl that rocks or to put a little pedestal in here. And a lot of the pieces that I do anymore uh, with bowls, I'll put a little, I'll make a little um, uh, tenon here and then make a, make a pedestal for it out of a different piece of wood, like an exotic hardwood, and just put that, put a socket in it and glue those together. So there's a pedestal that's a little bit different. Okay, so there, there's the chuck hole basically. I'm just going in there with a skew chisel to clean out that corner so that the jaw, the, the jaws of the chuck fit nice and tightly in there. Because you know, if you've done this with it, uh, I just pulled this out because I have it on the shelf and I never use it. It's a special little tool to make dovetail spigots, you know, for the chuck. I never use it. I just happen to see it there. So um So there's my, there's my chuck hold. It doesn't take any more, <clears throat> it doesn't take any more work than doing a traditional chuck hold. And you, I think you reap all the benefits of what I mentioned, which may be just an illusion <laughs> for me or delusion on my part, but it seems to work and it worked well with a lot of kids. So there's, there it is again, there, there's the spigot with a little dovetail. This needs to be nice and clean in there. There's the shoulder that stops the jaws of the chuck before they hit bottom, keeps it, everything nice and square. And then here's the line of separation, okay, where it's gonna be parted. So this is all the space that I have to work with in terms of my design. And if I made this bigger, I'd have lots more space. 
Okay, and there it is going in there. You see how it's bottoming out on that shoulder. And that keeps it nice and square. There's gonna be no wobble in it whatsoever once it's turned. And I can always take it off and remount it and hit those that same shoulder and you know there's gonna be no wobble at all. Okay, and I gotta get this off. Well, I already took it off. I think my camera failed again. Okay, now I'm just gonna I'm gonna start shaping this thing with my with my template. So I cut out that little template that I made with that gauge, that marking gauge. And I'm just gonna kind of eyeball this. I'm just you're not getting a great view of this because we're skewed a little bit. Uh, but when I'm looking straight down at it, I can get a you know pretty precise profile. And I'm just I'm just taking my little gouge here and I'm just shaping down the rim to the diameter that I know what I, I want to get, okay? So that that's round. <clears throat> You'll see when I stop here, this is pretty out of round. This has been sitting in a bin for about three years. So I'm just trying to get the whole thing round. So I'll start with the rim. <clears throat> This piece of cherry is completely, completely dry, but it just cut beautifully. So that's gonna become the rim. And then I'll start shaping from there down to the base. Just clean that surface up a bit. And instead of a parting tool, we're gonna to start calling that a skinny scraper. A skinny scraper, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've had this thing for years. It's a little Sorby thing. It was probably the cheapest thing that Sorby sells. And, and I started using it. And I said, my God, I can do all this different stuff with it. <clears throat> so it sits, it sits, sits right in the middle of the rack here. <laughs> and it, 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 it pisses me off all the time because it, it drops down and it disappears or it falls between things and I, you know, I've got to look for it and it's been five minutes looking for the damn thing. So here's the template and I'm just starting to shape that down. I'm just kind of, and, and as you can see, I'm just going to try to sneak up on this shape. Okay. Pretty much by eye. I mean, I, you don't really need a pair of calipers or anything like that if you've got that little template. So I think if you've never, if you've never made little paper templates like that to, to create a shape, ahead of time, it really works nicely. Uh, I'd really recommend it. It's the first thing I did with boys when I taught them to turn. First thing we would make is a bud vase. And the first thing we would do is just make a little paper template uh, to use as a guide. Yeah, this little gouge is a, I've got a bunch of these these old glazer tools. If you're not familiar with them, they were, I think they're probably a good 30 years old. And if you can never get your hands on any, they're fantastic tools. Uh, they were made by Jerry Glazer and and uh, they still, the company was bought and they still make tools, but not, not the originals. And they're just fantastic tools. Beautifully balanced. Handles are all weighted with, with, with lead shot. So they, they dampen the vibration. <clears throat> and that little gouge just has a standard, I guess you'd call it an Irish grind or a fingernail grind on it. And I'm just trying to, trying to approximate that shape that's on my little paper template. Now I am running at I, I am running at I, I might be running at about a thousand RPM here. 
you can see I'm a little bit a little bit fat right in here. So I'm a little I'm a little bit I've got about that much to take off really to and I'll start getting rid of it in here. So it's just a, it's really just a matter of eyeballing it and you know following that template and then you know doing it doing quite a few iterations of that until you sneak up on the final shape. <clears throat> I was kind of surprised that this piece of cherry that's so that's so dry was cutting so nicely. <clears throat> I'm still not quite there. And ultimately then, once I get that shape down, this whole this whole cylindrical area is going to come down, and this is going to curve completely round on the bottom. So if you put it on a tabletop, it'll just rock back and forth. Let me move up a little bit so we don't run out of time here. And I, I'm just doing I'm just doing bevel cuts here. You know, pushing pushing off the bevel. I think the biggest thing here is not to is not to push your luck here, not to get and not to get impatient. Because I think I'm sure a lot of you've had the experience where you think you're you can do something in one shot, and, and then you overshoot and you're screwed. So this part here where I'm trying to actually fit this to that socket on my base piece. I just, I just need to be patient and really sneak up on the shape. And then I'm, I'm gonna have to start being careful with that gouge going down into that cleavage there so I don't catch both sides of the gouge and jam, catch it in there. So you're gonna see, I'll bring out my little parting tool. My, what, what did you call it, Joe? Uh, uh, skinny, skinny scraper. A skinny scraper, yeah. I'm going to actually pull that out again to shape the bottom of this. <clears throat> so, Ryan, you're not getting any, getting any tear out? No, nothing. No, this piece cut beautifully. I'm not sure why. <laughs> <clears throat> because you, you uh, most people would cut from the... Um, bottom or in the opposite direction that you're cutting. yeah yeah I'm, uh, yeah i'm going downhill on the outside which is odd but it's it's cutting beautifully so i guess i guess the lesson is the textbook isn't always right <laughs> and you pretty much have to do it by feel and i just started trying this and it cut so beautifully so that it's screw the cutting uphill on the outside so here's my little my little skinny scraper and I'm just running that, I, I keep that edge nice and sharp in here along the side so that it actually cuts a little bit along that edge too. And I just found I, I can get right in there and I can get get right down to, you know, a round bottom if I want to with the, with the uh, parting tool. And since I have all this space here that I left um, beyond that shoulder to this side of the shoulder, all that area here is, is workable. In fact, I've made some things where I actually wanted to get the bottom rounder uh, and actually have gone down into the tenon to, for the bottom because you still have solid material that's inside the chuck here that you can work with to shape it. Let's move on a little bit here. I don't know if I'm there yet or not. I think my shape, I think I had my shape on that last check. And now I've just kind of, I've just kind of reestablished the place where my parting tool is going to go to part the thing finally. And I think just now I'm going to, I think I'm just going to flatten out that surface, make sure that that's nice and flat. And it's just a pull cut with the gouge, with that same gouge.
I can take that right up against that cup on the live center. And then I think I'll pull the, now I'm just gonna go down into that a little bit because I it's not gonna be a full blown bowl. It's just gonna have a certain depth to it to hold those votive cups. And these are just kind of standard bevel cuts. <clears throat> And now let's see what we have here. Let me push ahead a little bit. I think we're running, I'm running a little bit behind here. Okay, I'm gonna put a live center in there and then just take that, clean that center out right up to the, right up to the live center point. And I don't have to worry about this because I'm gonna take a Forstner bit and hollow and bore down into that. So this whole area will disappear from the Forstner bit and that's gonna become the recess that holds my votive candle. So I don't even have to worry about getting out that center here. And do you have cracks in that? Yeah, there were some, yeah, did you see some, you saw them in here? Uh, now on the left hand side there. Yeah, there's out. some cracks, but I'm gonna you're gonna see once we get into into embellishing it. I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that any places where there's uh, where there's flaws in the wood are gonna be covered by either burning or or or, or carving. Okay. And there are what I'm doing here is I'm taking the bigger votive cup and just kind of measuring how deep I want to bore out the recess for it. And I marked it on the outside here because uh, I want that to stick out. I want the glass to stick out above this rim by about a quarter of an inch. I just found on candles, uh, it looks nicer when you're burning the candle because you'll see the candle through the glass instead of having it buried deep in the wood. And then the second one I had there was the smaller votive cup, which is gonna go about that much deeper. Um, inside the thing. So it's gonna be done with, <clears throat> here's my Forstner bit for the bigger one. And then I'm gonna do the smaller recess for the smaller cup uh, with my little parting tool. Okay, so now we're just gonna bore down into there. And I, I think I think I missed it. Uh, I measured I measured the distance down to how deep I want to bore, and actually it turned out to work nicely because the distance that I marked out here is to terms of in terms of how deep I wanted that cup to go was exactly the the thickness of the Forstner bit. So I know now I just need to go down with my Forstner bit down to where that this top surface is flush with the rim. So you'll see in a second here, I'll just take a straight edge, hold it across the rim right. and make sure that it goes flush with that surface of the Forstner bit. This is on mute now, right? There we go. That's the right depth. Yes. Do you want your clear glasses? I can get them. Okay. Let me see if we can move on a little bit. Okay, now I'm just measuring the diameter because my Forstner bit, of course, is not big enough for my, my glass cup. So I just used some calipers and measured the diameter of the glass cup. And I'm just going to mark that on here. Just transfer that measurement with a pencil line. And that's how much I have to enlarge that Forstner bit hole. So again, I'm using my little parting tool. And I'm just going to go down in there and widen that hole with a nice straight wall. And that's about the diameter I wanted. I want a little bit of play in there in case anything shrinks or whatever that, you know, that thing's not going to get jammed in there. So, you know, a little less, a little less than an eighth of an inch on either side seems to work okay. 
I think I think these things. Whenever I make a candle holder like this, I, you know, it, it's going to be it's going to be pretty seasoned wood, because you certainly don't want this thing to shrink down into an oval, <clears> or <throat> an ellipse when you got a piece of glass in there. So I'm just cleaning that down. Let me move up a little bit here. Okay, now I've cleaned out, I've cleaned out the recess for the bigger cup. That's okay now, that fits in there nicely and bottoms out where I want it to so that the top of it sticks out about a quarter of an inch above the rim. And now I've got my smaller cup <clears throat> and I've just measured that diameter and I'm just gonna transfer that down inside of here. Okay, it didn't work well with those points. So I'm just gonna flip around the caliper here and do it with the other jaws and just that fits down in there nicely and I'm just going to take that and transfer that line in I'm sorry about the camera angle here I had one camera to do this with so I can't switch back and forth between seven cameras but I think you can get the gist of it and now I'm just going to take that little parting tool I'm just going to go right down along that line and hollow <coughs> hollow a flat recess about another quarter inch down below the first shoulder. And that will be the bottom for that second smaller cup. I gotta say, this is kind of spooky doing this because you can only hear yourself and don't hear any reaction or whatever. So I don't even know if anybody's out there yet. You still have an audience of 61. Okay. <laughs> I think you can see what, so that's just the little recess that I'm just pushing down into there to accept that other cup and keep it nice and centered. And I've got a skew chisel, a small skew chisel now, and you can't really see what I'm doing, but you'll see it a little bit later here. Um, I'm just taking the skew chisel down there, cleaning it up, and I'm, and I'm kind of doing a little round over dome on the bottom as a decoration since this is going to be visible and then that's going to be that little dome uh which is going to it's 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 convex from here it's going to be a little dome in here uh below the flat shoulder that the that the small cup is going to rest on and that little dome is then going to be carved decoratively at the end so that's what i'm doing here i'm just kind of just kind of creating by, by rocking that skew chisel pivoting a little bit it's going it's creating a little convex dome on the bottom i don't know if you can kind of get the gist of that you'll see it when in the next part Now I'm just, I'm just taking a measurement to see how deep the bottom is. And I'm gonna mark that on the outside because that's gonna dictate how deep I bore the 3 8 inch hole into the bottom of this little bowl for that brass rod so that I don't push through the bottom. So that's what that mark is for. And now I'm gonna start setting this up for wood burning and carving and stuff like that. So I've kind of identified all the spots that I wanna hide. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to use my little parting tool to just make some V cuts. Again, you could do this with a skew chisel or whatever. Um, and I'm just making some little V cuts in here that are going to serve as boundaries between burnt areas and, and carved areas. And uh, the only part that's going to re remain natural wood on here is this area here between these two incisions here. Okay. Then it's gonna to go to wood burning from here up. 
And then I'm going to do some more incisions around here. So there's going to be a burnt surface, textured surface up here over the rim. And then it's going to be textured with a, with a little dental burr from, from the burn area down uh, to this part here. <clears throat> so they're just making those, those V cuts, those borders. And then I think I'm going to make another one down in here as another border or boundary. And then there's going to be one, if I remember right, there's going to be one down here because I'm going to, I'm going to texture the bottom here. Okay. And then the only area that's going to be completely clean wood that needs to be finished is this area between here and this, this next incision up. So this area, this curved area here. Is going to be clean and in fact there were cracks in this thing on one side of it and i really didn't worry about that because the little cup is going to fit into the base with with the with the cracks uh with the cracks facing the back so you'll never see them <clears throat> okay so here's here's what we've got so here's that here's the here's the uh, recess for the smaller cup here's the shoulder for the bigger cup and here's that little convex dome that I did by rocking the skew chisel back and forth in here, okay? Which actually, whose crest is actually lower than this shoulder that the thing sits on, okay? And then this is all gonna be finished. I don't, I'm not even gonna bother about sanding any of this because this is all gonna be finished with either wood burning or carving in here at the end. And then this is gonna be, this is gonna be burned here, wrapping down into here. This is going to remain the same natural wood. This is going to be burned up here down to this next score mark, and we'll see where the rest of them are here. <clears throat> There's a boundary where the burning is going to stop. There's going to be texture between that boundary and this boundary, this is going to remain natural wood and this is going to be textured down here. So any of those areas between boundaries, I, I really don't care about the finish because they're all going to be hidden. And now I'm just going to sand this thing. I think I can, you don't need to watch sanding. Uh, this, th these are those strips, those uh, things that I got from online industrial supply, those, those plumber strips, which are great because they're only about an inch and a half wide. You can fold them up, they're cloth back so they last forever and they don't waste much. Uh, so I, I use these all the time. I keep a whole set of these on a rack. <clears throat> well, let's move on so we can stay on time here. I think I just did a check with my template here. What grits do those come in? Uh, they come in everything. I get them from, uh, I think I start with 40 grit, just in case I need it sometime. 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 150, 180. 220 and then I've also got 320 and 400 and I just put them on a, I put them on a dowel rod and make a rack out of them and I can pull and pull and mark them and pull them out they're fantastic and they're about 10 bucks a roll and they last forever and if you want the reference to it I can give you that I've got that all in a document how do you decide what you want to texture versus what you want to leave uh, natural wood. I mean, do you have any uh, rules of thumb or anything in terms of proportions? How much is textured and how much isn't? Not really. Pretty much by eye. Some of it is dictated by where there are flaws that I don't want to mess with, you know, trying to get a nice finish on them. So I'll just put those within a boundary and, and, and re realize that they'll go away <laughs> because they'll be covered. I don't have to mess with the finish. So it, it's kind of trial and error. So here, here I'm getting ready to part this thing. So I'm just taking my little parting tool and just rubbing the side up against the curve, tangent to the curve, and then just going down in there. And since I have all that area that I left open, you know, to the point where I put my parting line, you know, I can, I can do whatever I want in here and, and really not have to worry about, about uh, reverse chucking the thing. So if I wanted to make a, just a pedestal, just a cylindrical pedestal on here, I've got room to do that. I've got one here right now. And I can just take a narrow parting tool up, up to here 
I've got the space between the jaws of the chuck and, and the part, so I'm not going to hit the jaws. And I could put a pedestal on here if I wanted to, but I'm not going to here. I'm just going to round the bottom completely. So now I've gone to this. Uh, uh, if you ever used one of these, this D-Way makes this parting tool. It's a beautiful parting tool. Very narrow, very stable, firm, and nice and sharp and easy to sharp, sharpen. So I'm doing the same thing there. I'm just rubbing the, the side against the tangent to the curve and then just kind of pivoting a little bit like this to, to continue the curve round on the bottom. And I'm just gonna take that down. I'm gonna take that down to where there's almost nothing left. Uh, and on this piece, I don't have to worry about it because I'm gonna have a 3 8 inch hole that gets bored up in here to, to uh, hold the brass rod. That's the time. Oh, shit. Now this could literally be a, a pedestal here and I'd still have room to part it off and not have to reverse chuck it to finish it. And I'm not worrying about the finish on that part either, because that's going to be textured. And I'm just going to cut it off. I'm not going to. I'm not going to try to drop it off. And of course, my tool rest is here, so I don't know how many blades I've wrecked. You know, when it drops off onto the tool rest. So this time, I actually had the presence of mind to move the tool rest, so I don't chip the teeth. So there's the bottom, and that's going to that's going to disappear with the hole. Okay. So now. I think that's the end of this part. Uh, any, any questions? Do you, uh, do you do any sanding on the bottom of those? Like, I know you're pretty far in there with the parting tool. Do you just use the, the sand paper on the strips to get in there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I like those strips because they're cloth, cloth backed and you know, fold them over vertically, fold, fold them over horizontally, and you can make a little sanding belt out of them very easily. So they're, they're great to use. They're perfect for turning. Okay. Am I up, Joe? Yep. You're good. Okay. Okay. So now let's, now I am going to, I am going to reverse chuck this piece, but only to drill the hole in the bottom. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm measuring the rim and I'm measuring the depth. Okay. And there's my the depth of my recess. And I'm going to bring that around to the bottom. Measure that off on the bottom and then subtract about subtract about a quarter of an inch from that here. It's down to about here so that I, when I drill my hole, I know where to stop and don't push through the bottom. And I'm just going to reverse chuck this in that cylindrical recess. And I don't have to worry about the jaw, the, the jaws of the chuck marking up the thing, because that's going to be that's going to be textured anyhow or burned. So you know that's not going to show. What time is it? 11 Okay, there's my three eighth inch bit. Okay. 
And I'm just going to put a mark on here to measure, tell me where to stop. And then I'm going to, I'm going to move these along here. So I had this whole thing timed to about two hours, but I think since we started late, we're going to run over a little bit. So I'll try to push it along. Okay. What now? There's my there's my brass rod. <coughs> it's pretty snug, but once I get all the oxidation off of it, it's going to fit nicely in there. And now I'm just I'm just kind of checking my curve against the socket, okay, to make sure I got made that template right, and it looks. Looks pretty good. I've got a nice uniform space all the way around so that this thing will float above that socket by about three eighths of an inch. Okay, now I'm gonna remount the base. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get this, this plug, this one inch walnut plug ready to put down in here because if you remember, I want that to to make this recess for the for the brass rod nice and solid and to bond that bark to the solid part of the burl. So I've already prepared earlier. I already prepared with my little parting tool that flat spot that's an inch in diameter for the forster bit to start at so that it doesn't bind when I go in there when I plunge into there. Now I'm just boring that down into there. And that's just making the recess for, or the socket for that one inch walnut dowel. <clears throat> Wait a minute, I think I, Missed that, okay. There's my dowel. Looks like it's starting to fit in there. And then I think the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that dowel, mount it in a different chuck, in a smaller chuck jaw. And I'm going to drill out the 3 8 inch matching hole down the center of that dowel so that I can push my brass, I can put the dowel into the recess, glue it in, push my brass rod down into here, and it'll actually go down into the, into the burl and make a nice solid connection. And I'm just, I'm just parting where my plug is going to end up coming off. Establishing that just as a visual reference. And let's move ahead a little bit, just sanding that down a little bit because it was a little bit snug. <clears throat> and then I think I just took, again, I took my little parting tool and I just cut a little dimple at the center so that my, my drill bit has a, has a little pilot dimple to start in. And I'll just bore that out and, and you're going to see here, I didn't tighten the jaws tight enough, so it's going to push my, my plug down into the, into the jaw, into the chuck, but I'll go ahead and bore it out anyhow. Tighten it up a little bit. It'll stop eventually. It'll stop eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I've never done that. You've never done that? <laughs> never, ever. One of the reasons I turned, I, I'm not playing the sound here because probably you would have heard, oh, God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's move that along. I'm just kind of feeling that out to see how deep I got so that when I part, you know, I'll get past the hole and it'll pop off of there. Looks like I, I'm pretty good. 
Uh, well, I was a little shallow, so I'm going to go a little bit deeper so that it gets past my, my parting line. If we edit this video appropriately, we can have people questioning how you got that part underneath the spigot. Right. <laughs> and how I'm going to part it with it there, right? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, got it snugged up now. I'll just part this thing off. Just drop it off of there. Okay, now what am I going to do with this? So there's my plug. It'll accept that brass rod. That'll drop down in there. I'll use epoxy in there. And that should, I, as it turned out, that bonds that bark nicely to the rest of the piece. Let's move on here. Uh, I just put, I put the brass rod in there while I had this thing mounted now. And I'm just taking some, I think it's probably 220 grit of that, those, those sanding belts, I'm just taking the oxidation off of that and polishing that rod up a little bit so that it fits and I can still glue it. <clears throat> okay, what are we doing to do? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this was a mistake I made. I should have done this off the bat, right off the bat before I bored that hole in because this was never square, really, when I put the face plate on. So I, I wanted to square it off, but as a result, I think my hole here got out of, uh, out of alignment a little bit with the center line, or not, per not perfectly perpendicular to what's going to become the base here. So I had to do a little bit of messing around on it. Uh, uh, to get the, 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 the bowl to fit down into the socket nice and evenly. And I'm just going to power sand that, that socket a bit now with these sanding discs. Not a whole lot at all because it was pretty smooth from the Hunter thing. Uh, if, you're looking for any, if you're looking for any sanding discs, these things are fantastic. Uh, I got them on Amazon for about three or four bucks a piece, and they come with a cushion pad that you can take off, and they never seem to wear out. Okay, now we're into now we're gonna start finishing this stuff. I think I got a what a half an hour left, so we're gonna have to blitz through this. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> there we go. I'm gonna start by what do I do first here? I think I start with my little micro grinder. If you've never used one of these, they're really worth it if you're gonna do any sort of texturing. Um, there's the handle. <clears throat> Doesn't have a cable that's gonna snap or anything. There's the collet, you can fit, it's an eighth of an inch by default. You can fit a 332nd collet in or a 16th inch collet, which takes regular standard uh, carbide dental burrs, okay? And you just turn it here and it clicks and it opens up, you push a thing in there and it, and turn it again a little, about a little turn and it clicks and it locks it right in place. So this is what <clears throat> it looks like. This has a collet, this has a 332nd collet and a carbide burr clicked into place. And then it's got, it's variable speed. It's very comfortable to hold. And that's the cable, that's the cord that's attached to it. And now I'm just gonna start going at it within this boundary, okay? And I'm just gonna start texturing this. <clears throat> and it's a bit tedious, but once you get into the groove, this moves very fast, okay? Uh, this whole section in here probably took, it will take maybe 10 minutes to do, to do a complete texture. Uh, nice thing too is there'll be lots of little fuzzies that are left from the burr. And just a, a brass wire brush, you know, you can get them at Harbor Freight for almost nothing. Uh, just brush over it and it removes all of that. 
And then once you oil that, it, it just comes out to be this nice textured surface. You just have to be a little careful along the border here, this V cut that I made as the border. And just, you know, a lot of times I'll just go right along the border all the way around to establish the border. Okay, nice and carefully, and then just come back and you can kind of mindlessly fill in the rest of it. So that's how that goes. And I think I'm, I can save some time here by moving along here. You don't have to see this whole process. I don't think that's what it starts looking like. Okay, now I'm gonna to go to the wood burner. If anybody's in the market for a wood burner, this guy up in Minnesota that makes these, these pens um, um, that are fantastic. They're 20 bucks a piece. They're cheaper than anybody else's and they're, they're permanent. So, and uh, uh, if anybody's in the market for pens, they're fantastic. They're the best pens I've found. And if they break off, you just send them back and he replaces the whole tip for seven bucks. If he remembers to charge you. So I'm just taking this knife edge around here and I'm, I'm burning, I'm burning red hot. You can see that thing's red hot and it's gonna flame up a little bit once in a while. Okay, so I've got it all, all the way at the top end of the dial. And I'm just burning right now into that V cut all the way around as a border to establish the border. And I'm gonna do the same thing along here, along this V cut. So this area right in here is gonna remain natural wood this whole area is going to be burned with a texture as well as this area in here or around the, the lip. Okay. And the nice thing is that all that, all that staining that's happening here, the darkening, um, I'm, what, what I think it is chemically, I think it's the resin in the wood being vaporized by the red hot burn and then condensing right at the edge. So it's basically just a condensed resin a little surface and when you're done with it you just take some of that sandpaper like 220 or 320 grit rub over it and it disappears and it gets right down to you know a nice finish now i'm just establishing these boundaries now and regardless of how ratty they look they're going to actually clean up very nicely and very easily so i do notice on some of your end grain there you have some tear out is that you're just going to texture over that is that I'm going to texture over that. Yep. You mean out here, Joe? Yeah, on the on the yeah. side of the rim. Yeah, that's why I, that's why I decided to put these borders from here to here to avoid the tear out to burn over it. So then I don't have to mess with it. <clears throat> then I'll go in here and then do the same thing down in here. And I don't know if you noticed or not, one thing that I'm doing here is I'm leaning this knife edge away from the center. So as I was burning up here, I was leaning away by a couple of degrees so that it doesn't encroach too much on the area that's gonna be the natural wood finish. And it actually burns the inside of the V cut here. And I'm doing the same thing down here because the bottom, this bottom shoulder is gonna remain natural wood, but this is gonna be burned in here. So I'm, I'm leaning away from the area that's going to remain natural wood. And then I'll go, let's see. Let me speed up a little bit. Here, I'm just making a second pass around here because since it was a V cut, I'm just leaning, I'm leaning the, 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 the surface of the tool against that surface, that inside surface to make sure it's all burned so that no blank areas or no natural wood areas are left. So that it makes a nice clean border. Okay, let's go through this. I'm just doing that all the way around. So I'm just setting up all the borders. Okay, and now I'm gonna change pens and use, I've got a ball tip pen, a very small ball tip pen. It's like a little ball bearing that he braces on there. And I'm just gonna run it red hot again. And I'm just gonna start texturing all that whole surface in here with dots that are right up against each other, leaving no spaces at all of natural wood. It's just all going to be textured. 
And then at, at the end, I'll just take a brass brush and go over that. It'll, it'll get rid of some of the carbon, a lot of most of the carbon deposit. And it just makes a nice, nice dark brown finish. Uh, if I want to, um, if I want it uh, darken, you know, I can use like a trans tint black or dark walnut dye and just dye the whole thing with 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 a with a, a denatured alcohol solution of dye, and that dries right away and it makes a nice even color. Okay, so let's move on through this. So that's just going to be, and again, this goes a lot faster than you think it does if you're burning red hot. This whole rim around here probably took me half an hour at most. Let's just keep going. And now, now here's the area you were talking about, right, Joe? Yes. Yeah, I don't care about that. That's why I put those borders in here because this is going to be burned here. So that'll get rid of the tear out. And this is going to be textured, you know, with the, with the dental burr. So that'll get that, that that'll be, that'll disappear. Okay. Let's keep going. How do you avoid breathing in all that smoke? I've got a, I've got a heap of filter that's, you know, probably a foot away from this and it tends to set up a, a nice draft that I don't know if you could tell that was sucking the smoke away. And then I discovered, uh, I discovered that I've got a fan down there too. And if I point the fan counterintuitively, if I point the fan up to the ceiling above where I'm burning, it actually sets up a circulation pattern. So it actually drifts away from me into the HEPA filter. So now I'm just, that's the area that's, you know, got the tear out. These cracks here, I already put super glue in those and I really don't care about them because they're gonna face the back of the socket. <clears throat> so you'll never see them. So I think it's all about illusion. Okay, so now you're starting to see that the borders are starting to come together and it starts to, it starts to clean up nicely. Let's keep going here. Okay, now I'm just marking that center where I made that little dome and I'm just gonna carve that with a dental burr. So I'm just marking that up, little guidelines. And you, you can see how nicely this comes out. I've already, I've sanded this with some 220 grit. I just went by hand with my fingertip and just sanded around here a bit and it actually cleans up all that, that, that vaporized resin nicely on the surface. It's the same thing you get with a laser cutter. You know, when you, if, if if you use a laser cutter around wood, it vaporizes that resin too. And, and you just go over it with the light sanding and it takes it all off. Or denatured alcohol or acetone will do it too. And I'm just using that little dental burn. I'm just carving a little pattern in here. So I really don't have to worry about the finish there either. Let's just keep going here. Lots of little fuzzies, but then the, you know, the brass brush takes care of that. And then I'm just gonna texture the, that recessed area around there. That's what the small, uh, that's what the small uh, votive holder, the glass holder is gonna rest on. It's that textured surface. Okay, and there's what it starts to look like. And then the final thing will be, I've just got my, my favorite Minwax antique oil and a, you know, a soldering brush. I go through these soldering, but you can get them at Harbor Freight, or, you know, a pack of 50 or something for, for seven or eight bucks. I go through these like nothing. And I'll just coat this with Minwax antique oil. Let it soak in. And then basically when it's when it's wet, I'll just take a 
I'll just dry it off. I'll kind of tamp it off with a dry paper towel. Do you buy the expensive uh, Austrian or German uh, carbide burrs, or do you buy the cheap Chinese kind? No, I get them. <clears throat> Who's that guy that sells them online? He's a wood turner himself. Uh, he's got a website called uh, Burrs for Carving. I think the one word, Burrs for Carving. Can't remember his name. J. Paul Fennell? Yeah, that's it. I buy them from him. And uh, they're, they're standard dental burrs. You know, they're probably... You know, for a standard little dental burr, they're probably, they might be four bucks a piece, but they last forever because they're solid carbide. Okay, so now, yeah, I'm just going to soak that, let it soak in a little bit. And while it's still wet, I usually just dry it off. <clears throat> and then once it hardens, once it hardens up, maybe after 24 hours, I'll put another coat on. So I just, what I like to try to do is saturate the wood, okay, until it won't take any more. And then I sand, then I sand all of that shiny stuff off down to bare wood again, knowing that it's saturated, put a final coat on, wipe it dry, and then buff it. Let me get to the last one because we're running out of time, aren't we? Let's see if we can blast through this. I thought I had this all timed right. Oh, you but You're doing what's fine. that? You're doing fine. Okay. Okay. I've got my base mounted again and I'm going to create some more illusions, some more trickery. I just got this little torch, you know, these little butane torches that I use for just about everything, including starting fires in the fireplace and whatever. Harbor Freight again. I think you can get one for 10 bucks. And I'm just kind of scorching this, that cherry. Okay, and I'm kind of I'm kind of just kind of fading it out from the bottom to the top, and I'm going to gradually kind of fade it out till I've got, you know, natural cherry up on top here. I'm just trying to feather it in, and once I think I've got that <coughs> feathered in, the brass brush will come out again, and just kind of do some more feathering. I think probably I, I'm not showing this, but I'll I'll take my I think I took my wood burner, one of my pen tips, one of those knife edge pen tips. It's got a little bit of a wider wire on it, okay? And just take that down into the cleavage here and just burn down to the bottom of that cleavage, okay? So that it's a solid black, okay, at the end. And you can see how nice the, you know, the wire, the, the, the brass brush just kind of gets rid of a lot of the carbon deposit and kind of kind of blends it in or feathers it in. You just have to play with this a bit. It's it's pretty much, you know, it's almost like, almost like painting, you know, you just kind of feather it. Okay, then I took a heat gun and since that burl, I think I bought that burl somewhere. So it was coated with, it was saturated with a protective wax. <clears throat> and I just took the heat gun. You can see some of the bark's actually popping off. I just take the heat gun to melt the wax out to get down to bare wood. And I, I these are Harbor Freight throwaway brushes, two chip brushes, and I just I buy a whole supply of these. And I find that these are really nice to get, you know, to get down in there, you know, and I'll get get the wax out of there with the wire with the brush, and then tamp it off. Okay, so what am I doing here? Oh, I'm gonna sand the flat surface. This is the first surfaces that I left flat that I wanna keep smooth. And I'm just gonna use one of these little fine sanders to do that. You can use just about anything to do that. Okay. We don't have to watch the sanding process, I don't think. Okay. I'm gonna take some super glue and take it down in there where I know that there are loose, loose surfaces on the bark. Didn't use any accelerator because it'll fizzle and you know make that white fizzle. 
Okay, take my face plate off finally. And when I take this off, you'll see where I actually had to, where I actually had to put a splinter in one of the holes that to get some more bite for the thread. I'll be here in a second. See it? <laughs> it's where one of the screws came loose, but it held okay after I put the splinter in there. Okay, now I'm just going to take a, a pull saw and cut right down along that line that I parted at the end to flatten the bottom. That's going to be my bottom now. Now what? Okay, now you're not going to see this, but I've already cut on the bandsaw uh, a pedestal for it to sit on. And I'm just truing this up. And I'm just using a, I'm just using that little gouge, that little glazer gouge that I've got, and just doing a shear cut on it. You can see those nice hairy fibers coming off with the shear cut. If you're new to turning, it's a, it's a, it's really a very helpful cut. It doesn't, it's counterintuitive because you flip the gouge over pretty much upside down and just use the edge. Here I'm doing another shear cut with the with the, the skew chisel, just using running it at an angle and it does just the same sear cut. You can see those nice hairy fibers that are coming off and it'll leave a glassy smooth surface on that, on that grain. This is that Peruvian walnut that smells like it smells like cow shit when you turn, <laughs> when you do that. <clears throat> now I'm just using the skew chisel to make a little notch at the corner because this is going to be the very bottom. It sits on the tabletop and I'm cutting a little notch in the corner, okay, that's going to be burned with that burn texture. I just, I like, I like creating shadow lines between pieces of wood, okay. So this will become a shadow line between the base and the tabletop. Let's move on here. Then I'm gonna just turn some more incisions here as border line, borders for the burning. I'll do another one here. That's gonna provide me with a border to texture the bottom with the dental burr all the way to the center. <clears throat> And I'm just going to use a, I'm just using a, a skew chisel again to make a shear cut across the bottom to smooth that out a bit. Uh, this area is going to stay natural wood. This area is going to be inside this border is going to be textured with the dental burr. And this whole area here, the shadow line is going to become burned with the, the, the burn te texture. Again, I really like using that cup on the Nova live center because you just push it up against there and it'll push it and square it really nicely to the to the spur drive. Let's see here. Where can we go here? So there's there's the there's the shadow line, the recess. And I've also cut a, a wedge shaped piece on the bandsaw that's going to sit on top of that. So the actual uh, the actual beaded cherry piece is going to sit on that. Okay. And I'm going to, since I can't do this any other way, I'm just taking an X-Acto knife and I'm going to cut a line, score the fibers on that, that wedge shaped piece that's going to be part of the pedestal. I'm just cutting that to score the fibers. And then I'm going to go after it and create the shadow line recess with my micro motor and a little cylindrical bit. Let's see here. There we go. There's a little cylindrical bit. I'm, just, I'm gonna go right along that cut line and the fibers will just, they'll break off because they've already been cut, you know, with the X-Acto knife. And I'm just gonna go along here. This doesn't take long at all. Um, and I'm gonna do that on my, on my base too. I'm just gonna go around and create a nice, like a quarter inch wide shadow line between the base and that wedge shaped piece that's gonna serve as the pedestal. And so I'm just removing material here to recess this, create a shadow line. 
And then that's gonna be burned again with that fine burn texture. Let's keep going here. Uh, here's the, a lot of times if these pieces are square or something, I'll just do the, you know, you can just do these on the table saw, just make like a, do a, just a rabbit cut at the corner to create like the shadow line. As long as you've got a fence to hold this against. Unlike one of my colleagues at school years ago who, uh, who remain unnamed, who I caught one night with a bunch of boys in the wood shop after school, cutting a four by four sheet of three quarter inch plywood freehand without a fence. <laughs> Yikes. And I said, what the hell are you doing? So I do this all the time. <laughs> I said, well, then you're living on borrowed time, buddy. <laughs> It's amazing how many stupid human tricks people are capable of, huh? That's for sure. We've certainly seen enough of it during COVID, haven't we? <clears throat> We've even seen people turn off center pieces with two screws. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, go through this. So I'm just, you can see what a mess this looks like, but it's amazing how much this cleans up at the end. So now I'm just going through, I'm just, I've, I'm using a bigger burr to just kind of clean that out once I've established the edge and create the recess for the shadow line. And I just, I've got a, I've got a, um, uh, uh, Festool's uh, one of their big shop backs, which is the best thing I've ever bought. I think I use it for everything, and I just hook it up to here and and you know put that nice and close, and that keeps the sucks up all the dust as I'm grinding like this. And now I've just got another burr on here, a bigger burr, and I'm just going to kind of smooth all of that out, that recess, that shadow line. And I've got my red hot blade again i'm just going to go and establish a nice clean <clears throat> edge at the border for the shadow line i just found since you know quite a few years ago when i started texturing stuff like this and burning stuff the most important thing is establishing those borders those nice clean sharp borders makes all the difference when you're texturing something I'm doing the same thing under here in the corner for that shadow line, and then that's just going to be burned too as a burnt texture. Same thing on the bottom, just going around and establishing the burn to darken the bottoms of those those incisions as the border. You can see you can see the stuff, you can see the resin vaporizing on the surface immediately or condensing on the surface right away. There's my little heap of filter sucking that stuff off. I'm sorry, I'm having to rush through this. I, I thought I had it time, but I think you get the point. And then we'll just burn that, that kind of ballpoint texture all the way around here. Make that shadow line. Once in a while, I pop those balls off the ends of them because I'm so hard on them. I'm gonna, you know, call up my guy up in Minnesota that makes these. He'll, every time I call him, he says, what the hell are you doing with those things to pop those off of there? I said, well, I, <laughs> I run the thing red hot. Because <laughs> most wood burners that do pyrography as an art form don't never want to burn red hot they all you know they'll always be down around number two on a 10 scale you know to make nice feathers for a decoy or something like that but i guess i'm too crude an individual for that and i'm just so i'm doing that and i'm going to come in here where all this bark is i'm going to use the basically use the burner almost like a brush <clears throat> 
Now here's another tip that he makes, which makes that basket weave pattern uh, that you see once in a while. Uh, uh, and he makes a really nice one. Uh, I used to make these by, you know, by myself with a, by coiling a wire around a, a nail and putting them in a, a tip. And uh, this guy up in Minnesota makes these, they're beautiful. They, they're just really rigid and solid and you can press on them and they transfer the heat really nicely. And they make that nice basket weave pattern if you alternate the, the pattern on them. Is it noon yet? It's noon. I'll push it through here and we'll finish. Yep. So now I'm just going to kind of go in here and clean up a lot of this stuff in the bark to darken it a bit. Let's see. Assemble the parts. So there's the parts. And I just drilled a hole through the two parts of the pedestal and into the bottom. And there's the finished, the finished bowl that holds the, and there's, there's the shadow lines. Now this stuff needs to be cleaned up yet. I haven't oiled this yet, but it'll, it'll clean up very nicely. You know, I'll sand it all down, you know, to 320 grit probably, and then oil it, uh, let it harden up. Um, oil it again. And, and all the finishing I do is that Minwax antique oil. And I, you know, I put several coats on over a multiple days until it's saturated. And then the final coat will be shiny. And then I'll sand that off with 220 or 320 grit, just sand it down to bare wood. But knowing that the wood's saturated now, I'll, I'll rub on a final coat, rub that completely dry, let it, let it cure overnight. And then I'll take it onto that Beal buffing system with the three wheels, with the Tripoli, the aluminum oxide, and the, the Carnauba wax, and buff it. And it makes a beautiful, lustrous finish. Now I'm just going to, I'm just kind of putting these together. I think you can see the, the shadow line between the piece. I did some, some texturing above the shadow line too, just to add a little interest to it. And you can see how the shadow lines, those recessed shadow lines kind of make the pieces float between each other a little bit. This is the hardest part of the whole project is getting that damn dowel into that hole. It's a good thing there's no sound here too. That's Minwax antique oil over there, not bourbon. <laughs> I learned that lesson. About that. I learned that lesson 20 years ago about not mixing alcohol with lathe turning. And there, there's basically the final product. It's all cleaned up. So you can see how nicely all that crud that looks like it's never going to clean up, you know, does clean up. And I think the, the little textures and the shadow lines add a, add a nice little dimension to the whole thing. And these parts are all the parts that were kind of scrubby, torn out grain, and they're, they're gone. Very nice. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll end with one of my, we'll end with the final, the final line of one of my favorite songs, the old shaker hymn, Simple Gifts, which I still maintain was about wood turning and not about dancing around in a circle in a religious ceremony. For the turn, turn will be our delight till by turning, turning, we come round right. Okay, that's it. Nice job. That was a spectacular piece. Anybody uh, there yet? Looks good. Uh, oh, yeah. You still got 54 people here. Oh, God. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Ryan, now, uh, Ryan, Ryan, do you... Uh, do you have, uh, do you put the antique oil into the bark areas too and buff the bark areas? I, yeah, no, I, I do put the, bar, the antique oil into the bark areas or just about anything. And what I do with the bark area then is I'll, I'll soak it with the antique oil and then take one of those, uh, those chip brushes, those cheap bristle chip brushes from Harbor Freight, and a dry one, and just tamp it in there a lot of times and it, you tamp it three or four times to pick up some of the oil and then 
dab it onto a dry paper towel. Just keep doing that. And eventually that'll take off all the, all the excess oil and the rest of it will soak in and leave a nice darkened finish on the oil and hard, harden the bark too. Okay, that, is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't buff the bark at all. I, it, well, it, on this one, it would have torn off. You know, so. one of the things that is nice about this demo is that we don't often see in, in the in-person demos to see all of the whole process, right? Because the like all that texturing and all of that stuff would normally just not happen in a yeah yeah it's nice to be able to see all of that. No, I, li I like I like this method. It's it, it, you know the editing takes a while. I haven't edited video edited in about five years, so I had to kind of relearn Adobe Premiere. But it came back, and uh, you know probably takes as long to edit it as it does to do the actual proud project. But that's okay, Riney. If you yeah. ever for your shadow lines, have you ever yeah. used a router instead? A router? Yeah. Uh, no, I can't say that I have. Uh, I'll use the tables if, if I've got like a square base that I've made for a lamp or, or any sort of, you know, turned piece that I put a square base on. You know, as long as it's got, you know, straight edges that I can run up against a fence, I'll just use it on the table saw, you know, do a rabbit cut, you know just set the blade up about a quarter inch off the table and then run it along all four sides. But I couldn't do that in these curved pieces. So no, I've not used a router. Okay. I think first of all, because routers always have scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I guess I'm too impatient when it gets down to that to set up the router and everything. And yeah. So I just use that little micro grinder and it seems to work okay. It's, pretty, it's faster than it looks. Just a footnote to this, Riney. One of my pleasures when I was teaching at UH uh, at the University School. Yeah, coming coming in this early and seeing the Tom. display of all of your pieces of your kids, uh, kids, the boys, and what they had produced and how varying it was, but also the quality, considering how limited their experience was on a lathe. Yeah, no, it was, it was very, very impressive. It was very rewarding for me. I mean, it's one of the best things I ever did in the shop is to turn to this. And 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 one of the one of the great things about it was that they started, you know, creating artwork. And we actually, you know, we actually started entering pieces, wood pieces in in scholastic art competitions that were juried, you know, and actually got we actually got a bunch some pieces up on the stage of Carnegie Hall as, you know, in the top hundred pieces of artwork in the country out of 50,000 entries. And it always kind of baffled me. And my conclusion is after entering stuff in jury shows myself since I retired, artists who jury on, on art juries or competitions have no familiarity whatsoever with wood. So it's a complete mystery to them. And when they see something entered, which they normally look at and say, oh, that's craft, not art, you know, entered in a show, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's guilt or, or whatever, but they'll end up, they'll end up selecting the piece and it works in our favor as wood turners, I think. So, so enter your stuff in juried art shows because they won't know what the hell to do with it. <laughs> That's a good tip. <laughs> any other questions? You attempt to uh, counterweight any of those before you turn them? To counterweight them? No, it's a good suggestion. No, I might try that next time. <laughs> no, the, the, some of the pieces I showed you that that actually had a that actually had a hole down through them. You know that I bored out with a Forstner bit. It's not a problem with those because they're always they're always stabilized with the center with the with the live center. And once once I bore down into them to make the recess like for a vase. Um, I just keep the Forstner bit right in there instead of the live center, and that stabilizes the whole thing. It balances it. So, yeah, I, I might I, I shouldn't have done this this one with that with those two screws and that face plate. But <laughs> again, I had started I had started filming, and I said I can't go back now because I'm into it. And uh, so I just kept going with my fingers crossed. Well, it, and, and one thing to note here. Mortar drill? What's that? Something to note here too is that you've got experience. Micro mortar drill. I, I've got two people I'm hearing. 
Okay. I asked, where did you get the micro mortar motor drill? Um, I, I, well, I, I, the guy up in Minnesota, uh, uh, it's a website called carvertools.com, www.carvertools, one word, dot com. Guy by the name of Pat, who's a electronics whiz, makes these things, but he was making the micro grinder, okay, and some Jap some company started selling some knockoffs that actually put his logo on the on the unit, which was about 200 bucks. And they were made with these cheap shit Jap uh, Chinese hand pieces. So he started getting calls from people all over the place that bought these things saying, I need to send this back. My hand piece is broken. And it wasn't his hand piece. It was a knockoff. And uh, so he stopped, unfortunately, he stopped making the micro grinder because he got pissed off and he's just making the wood burner now. Um, but I, I, and the, the ones that are out here now are pretty expensive. Uh, you know, the, the Cadillac is NSK, which makes dental tools, you know, but their unit, their, their motor control unit and the handpiece is about 1500 bucks. But um, I think there's a couple cheaper ones on the, I've got one that I use to made by Fordham, you know, the people that make those, all those grinders. And they make one that's about 300 bucks, I think. That's a nice tool. That's pretty much like the one I've got from Pat up in Minnesota, okay? But if, you, if you're in the market for a wood burner or wood burning pens, he's the guy to go to. He, he makes the best stuff around and the best prices. You can get his wood burner unit for about 104 bucks and the pens are 20 bucks a piece, which is cheaper than anybody else. And I would recommend if you're using a wood, if you're gonna do wood burning like that, you stay away from the wood burning pens that have that have replaceable tips in them. Uh, Burn Master makes one of them. Burn Master is a good control unit, but the, the pens are have replaceable tips that have two little brass screws in the tip, and you can buy the replacement tips to put in there, and they just don't burn as well. Uh, so Pat makes all of his. They're all they're all fixed tips, okay, that are brazed in, and you know each pen is its own unit. And, um, you know, like I say, if you break a tip off of one of them, no matter what, I just call them up, I send it back, you know, with, in a little U.S. Postal Service package and he, he replaces them, you know, sometimes he charges me, sometimes he doesn't. So uh, th that's the bed, best wood burning unit I found. And I, I guess a for them, and they may never get there. What's that? <laughs> send a postal and they may never get there. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, hey, Ryan, Ryan, just an yeah. idea for people. And that is next time you go to your dentist, just yeah. ask what burrs they have that they usually keep a entire inventory of used burrs. They oh, come dude. in all sizes. Some are diamond, some are carbide. They're all free, at least mine are. Uh, and you can try them. I know mine fits perfectly in a, in a Fordham. Yeah, and I think yeah. it fit into a, Drex, a, a Dremel. Do you have a Fordham micromotor, Tom? No, I've got a full Fordham. A full Fordham, okay. But with it fits. The, with, the, with the quarter inch. Yes. Shank, okay. But it will yeah. work in a Dremel or anything else, and it's fun to yeah. play with, if nothing else. Exactly. No, I do that whenever I'm at the dentist. I haven't been at the dentist since COVID started, but we're going next month. That, um, but yeah, I get those, and I get the other thing I get from them is, uh, is all the dental picks, you know, the, the, the cleaning tools because they're fantastic to do detail work with. So I got a whole collection of those that they that they would throw out or, or, or scrap out, I think, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Well, if there are no other questions, uh, I'd appreciate it if you would send us a list of all your suppliers and contacts for them. I will uh, do that. If you uh, send it to me, uh, I'll make sure that uh, they get on the website or in. And also to uh, Mike Bracken, he'll get it in the newsletter. Okay. Uh, actually, the probably sending it to Mike Bracken for the newsletter would probably be the best. Okay. Does Mike that agree way. with that? Mike Bracken? <laughs> Are you there, Mike? Okay, I'll send it to both of you, okay? All right, that'll work. It, it'll, then, it'll, it'll be a PDF attachment, okay? It's all on a PDF be file. Great. That would be great. 
And uh, I want to thank you personally. That was an excellent demo. Uh, I personally got a lot out of it. <laughs> and uh, you're going to make me try some new things. <laughs> okay. Uh, goodbye, hats. Well, yeah, goodbye hats for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I'm probably I'm probably slated to do it. I've never done a hat. I'm slated probably to do that too. <laughs> so yeah, any any time, just yell, okay? Because I can I can put together something too. I've done a lot of different embellishment things, and okay.